Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Surawat Sam from Yotin. I'm the director of the Sassin Sustainability and Entrepreneurship Center. I'm very, very pleased and honored to, uh, to have this uh, opportunity to present our esteemed guest. Uh, his, his bio is so long that <laughs> and, and um, impressive that I, I'm gonna, I might not do it justice, okay? But I'll give you some of the, some of the key bullet, bullet points, or at least a couple of them. All right, so this is uh, Dr. James R. Calvin, PhD. He is a professor of management uh, and organization at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. Right? He's also the interim director for the Center for Africana. Uh, he's had really, really broad global experience. Uh, even before all this, um, a deep, uh, we had the chance to talk yesterday. I could really peer into his um, uh, sort of roots from even before here as a passion for, um, I like the way you described it. You're talking about organizations and comparing them to like a human body. Right? Yep. So like there's a tendency in organizations to be very compartmentalized and people are sort of like, well, there's those guys and those guys and those guys. But looking at it, everything is a system. And I think that was really, really interesting. So he's got this deep experience in executive management, mid-level uh, leadership. So really addressing the kind of the interconnection within the organization. Uh, community and organization development, executive coaching. He's a co-editor uh, the um, uh, Innovative Community Responses to Disaster and a board member of Pixera Global. Right. Also, uh, congratulations once again that you're the recipient of the, he's a recipient of the 2019 Ted K. Bradshaw Outstanding Research Award for Superior Research, making a huge impact in his field. So please give me, uh, join me in giving a big round of applause uh, to, to Professor. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Okay. Um, this will be interactive. Uh, so what I would like that to mean is uh, if I say something and you want me to uh, say a little bit more about it, excuse me, or you have a question, uh, we'll pause and then we'll move along. Uh, I'm going to reference uh, several items and pieces uh, during the talk. How much time do I have for the talk, actually? Because this way I want to time it so I'll know to move along. One hour, that's right. I remember all of the communications and see, it's good to be uh, told again how much time you have. Yes, yes. <laughs> It's a wonderful, uh, we're going to archive it, <laughs> okay? But I know it's, uh, we're going to add to those pages. So uh, what we're going to do initially is I'm going to want you to see two short videos. Uh, when we met last year, uh, it was about innovation for humanity at the Cary Business School. Uh, innovation for humanity is something that... Uh, we built our global MBA around uh, once the business school, uh, the Cary Business School uh, began. And at that time, we were working with the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, and then we transitioned to the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. The second piece of this, uh, and it all comes together, uh, and as I was at the hotel working, uh, is to talk about some of the stories and the way in which we're going to lay the stories out uh, going to be as follows. You know, theor theory in terms of community economic development, uh, the whole idea in terms of the purpose of the Millennium Development Goals uh, and what may have been accomplished uh, globally in terms of that perspective. And then the follow-on uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals to 2030. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, how this uh, connects uh, not only with Baltimore, uh, but in some of the other uh, countries uh, and cities uh, in different parts of the world where we can talk about uh, community ownership, community partnership, and how 
the sustainable development goals, working towards those and transferring uh, skills and knowledge both ways, not just from the university in terms of our view and the partnership, but with our partners in terms of what they're seeking to do because this is meant to be living. And so what we're going to begin with actually right now is a short video. One of the teams uh, with me uh, in Lima, Peru, and if we can see that first short YouTube video. There were like five YouTube videos with me and I thought, since I'm going to be here, you don't need to see me. We'll show one of the teams. Good idea, right? That's what I say. So this will be Innovation for Humanity, and you'll hear that voice. Innovation for Humanity is a really big concept. It's an opportunity to see another culture, to see another city, and to put into practice the business concepts that we learn in our first semester here in the MBA program. I4H definitely stood out to me. It was a program unlike any other program at any other school. A traditional international experience for an MBA student would be a valuable one. They'd probably go to a fairly familiar, familiar location, say in Europe, and that's, I think, an extremely valuable experience, but it doesn't give the student a hands-on uh, personal feel. I went to Peru, came back after three amazing weeks. The school gives you an opportunity to practice everything you see in class every day. I think coming in, we were a little bit skeptical of how our project would help the nonprofit that we were working for. They used to build houses for families in slums, and they now have shifted to doing more community social programming. Our project working with Techo was to assist them in figuring out which community projects they're going to do, have a better system of benchmarking and selecting projects. And we just built a tool for them to be able to measure their social impact. That allows them to have a more objective measure of the potential successfulness of a project or the past successfulness. Before coming in, you have different expectations of what this project is going to be like. And as you move forward, you see that if you really want to create something innovative with people in mind, it needs to be very simple and, and very easy to adopt. You're sitting in a classroom in Baltimore and you're trying to envision what these communities are. And every conversation we had with them, they're describing a community. But only when we got to Peru, we saw that this is not a discrete community. It's not just a collection of a few houses. It's literally millions of people living in these types of conditions. Our sponsor kept saying, yeah, the communities would love stairs. And we kept asking the stairs to where? These are in the Andes Mountains. They're huge, and the homes go all the way to the top with generally no roads, no water, no sewer. Without stairs, you're basically carrying water and groceries and, and whatever it is all the way up the top. That changes the way you approach pretty much everything. My one big takeaway is that business in and of itself can actually very much help humanity. People have to be extremely resourceful, and this is what we felt our students needed to learn most. While we were there, a few families came up to meet us. They saw the Techo shirts of the people that we were working with, and they came up and immediately gave us a hug. They were incredibly thankful for our work and for Techo's work in the communities. Nonprofits do need business expertise and business skills, and I think us being able to help them, even for the three weeks in our time in Baltimore, has shown me just how much of a difference I can make personally. One of the things that I try to do throughout my career is make sure that the projects I'm choosing are improving the lives of the people who are using. So for me, it was very important to find a program that's committed to help the layer of society that can be improved the most. So a, a, a glimpse of this is action work, uh, it's real-time work. 
Uh, we certainly, in our approach to innovation uh, for humanity, uh, in the CARI model, it's more about solution finding and solution building together uh, with our partners. Uh, and, and we begin that process in Baltimore. And let me just say a little bit more about Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore is nestled between Washington, D.C., uh, its neighbor about 37, 40 miles south, and Philadelphia. So it's that powerful East Coast. Uh, but Baltimore is very much uh, uh, like Lima. Uh, it's very much like Hyderabad. It's very much like uh, many of the places where we're doing uh, sustainable development goal initiatives uh, and efforts uh, with partners. Uh, more currently, uh, one of the groups that I work with uh, and, and colleagues at our Bloomberg School of Public Health are a bunting neighborhood leadership fellows. And so it's a city of contrast, uh, very much like Bangkok, although you could probably put 20 Baltimores inside Bangkok. Uh, just given the enormous scale and, and size of this vibrant city. And so those Bunting Neighborhood Leadership uh, Fellows, uh, their interest and goal is to tackle uh, a worsening housing um, situation. What are the options uh, for poor and working families in terms of affordable housing and how do they get into the mainstream. There are uh, issues in terms of transportation. Transportation is vital and key to livelihood and work. And, and so we have the imbalances of a phrase uh, that I'm sure you've heard here of the haves and the have-nots, right? So, so we have an upper class and we have a widening uh, lower class. Uh, Issues of poverty and inequality, industry, you know, it perpetuates many of the conditions uh, in terms of what the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are meant to uh, address in ways in which we bring more people into the economy. Let me say a couple of things, and then we see one more short video, and I want you to know that this talk is not about all videos. But I want uh, to introduce another of our alums, Kevin White. Uh, we were at the UN, United Nations, uh, two years ago. Right around uh, this time, uh, I was surprised uh, because uh, he was a global champion in the Social uh, Solutions Summit uh, that the UN does on an annual basis. And, and what the Solution Summit seeks to do is find those individuals, groups, and organizations who are working with the Sustainable Development Goals in terms of global partners. So that's one of the requirements is that they're not just single country based, but that they are working across borders in terms of uh, a critical set of issues that are the Sustainable Development Goals. And the people at the UN didn't let me know that Kevin was a finalist. They couldn't have done that. That would have blown his cover. Uh, it would have blown my cover, not that I was there to do anything other than to be a judge. Uh, and you'll see me come on stage in a cameo uh, for about 30 seconds to say something. But this is sort of about Kevin and the vision of his partners. So let's see uh, Solution Summit 2017. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin White, as you heard. <laughs> so worldwide, there's an estimated two and a half billion people that need eyeglasses that, that, have, that suffer from poor vision. And if you suffer from poor vision, it really affects every aspect of your day-to-day -day life. It's difficult to learn, you can't see the chalkboard, difficult to drive. Uh, you, you actually become an increased burden upon your family. And the, uh, sorry, <laughs> they, uh, it's, it's a real challenge to, to live a healthful and productive life if you can't see. This epidemic affects every aspect, every aspect of your life, and you become, uh, it's difficult to overcome the, the challenges of a, of a life with, with poor vision. But it's an easy problem to solve, right? 
I mean, for 500 years, we've just applied glasses to this problem, and people can see clearly. And if you need glasses, for most of us, it's very simple. You go to an optometrist, you get your eyes checked, and you're done. You get a pair of eyeglasses. But what if there was only one optometrist for every 8 million people? In parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, this is a reality. And the cost of glasses is pretty cheap. So it's not the cost of glasses that's the problem. It's that there's a complete lack of infrastructure that can effectively diagnose people with poor vision, determine what the prescription for each eye is, and then provide those eyeglasses. And the existing solutions are not only complex, they're extremely expensive, and it takes years to make an eye care professional. In 2005, as you heard, I was a United States Marine, and I was conducting or was planning humanitarian civic assistance operations in Africa. And my first deployment was to Morocco, and I witnessed uh, a military unit giving away eyeglasses. They were donated eyeglasses. And as a professional logistician, I was really offended at the inefficiencies of this system. And I thought to myself, you know, someone should do something better than this. And what I didn't know was that interaction was going to chart the next 12 years of my life. So I started Global Vision 2020 when I retired from the Marine Corps in 2009, and we started working with different technologies that could lower that educational threshold. And what I came up with was a kit that anyone can take anywhere and provide eyeglasses. And the heart of the kit is the UC, and it's a diagnostic tool that the patient simply turns the dial and determines their prescription. The kit also includes a near chart and distance chart and a user's manual. And then it comes with multiple, multiple color frames so that the patients can pick a color that they like, and then lenses to fit all, uh, all needs for near distance, for, for near vision and for distance vision. And here's how it works. So local networks, and this is Henry, he's a community healthcare worker, admit, he's, gives a patient a, near, a dis, near chart and, and a distance chart test to determine best visual acuity. And we use an e-chart so we can overcome any literacy issues. And if the patient needs eyeglasses, they simply put on the UC and they turn the dial until they get their best visual acuity. You then find the lens that correlates to that power and you snap it into one of the, one of the frames. And the frames are pretty nice. As you can see. <laughs> Unrehearsed. It takes only a few minutes to do and it's <laughs> as simple as dial snap wear. We've already conducted extensive field trials at high schools in Mozambique using teachers as the distributors and in Ghana using community health care workers and volunteers. And in just a matter of hours, these networks, these local networks, were able to screen and dispense hundreds of glasses to students that had no option before and villagers in Ghana and provide that fix to this disability. And it really is a disability. We've already conducted clinical trials at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins University and the New England College of Optometry in Boston. We are ready for full scale, for, for large scale distributions to include national programs, but we need some help to get there. We need funding to take the UC from small scale 3D printing to full scale injection molding. We need funding, we want to uh, make... Perfect. So I just wanted to sort of lay this out because uh, one of the key things with the sustainable development goals uh, as this work continues, not only from our perspective uh, at the Carey Business School and Johns Hopkins and, and our many partners, but it's how do we scale up solutions? You know, once solutions and, and innovations uh, that begin to mitigate uh, some of the many challenges uh, that are faced by uh, the 7.4 billion people uh, that we share this planet and we know about the health of the planet and, and what are we doing as stewards, in our own individual ways, what are our governments doing, uh, what, are, what, what are citizens doing, right? Because that's the core fundamental. Two things always stick in my mind when I see this. Uh, I was unaware that 2.5 billion of the 7.4 billion of us who currently uh, reside on this earth, you know, our sight, uh, th there are those who don't have adequate glasses, right, or contact lenses, and, and that is vital in terms of, of uh, changing that. If we can turn to the next slide, I'm sure you've seen and, and heard about uh, these 17 Sustainable Development Goals to 2030, and uh, there are an array of them. 
I want to just mention number 16 briefly. Uh, one of my former students, Abraham McCoy, uh, who is now at the World Bank, in July, July is a really important uh, month for me, I'm finding out. Uh, that's when I met uh, Nick last year, it was in July. It's July, I'm back here this year. But there was the birth of the country of South Sudan in July, and that was in July 2010. And some of you may be aware of uh, the years of strife. And so Abraham went in uh, to work with the government uh, around infrastructure. And just a little bit about that, you know, peace seemed like it was possible. And so this sustainable goal in terms of peace, justice, uh, and strong institutions uh, Abraham was part of, or is part of a global group, both at the bank uh, and in a number of countries where that one is vitally important because if we think about conflict uh, in this world, conflict is in many corners and parts of the world. And I wanted uh, to highlight that. So as I go forward in this talk, uh, we're going to hit or talk a little bit about clean water and sanitation. Uh, we're going to talk about life on land. Uh, we're going to be focusing on gender equality, uh, etc. So, if we can now change to the next slide, which is the eight UN Millennium Development Goals. And those goals, uh, oh, clicker, thank you. Thank you. See, we hadn't practiced this. And uh, I hadn't asked for it, now I have it. I got the power, right? <laughs> so thank you, Mook. I can, I can switch uh, as I need to. Uh, so let me say a little bit about these goals. Yes, they're there. To eradicate extreme poverty and, and hunger. That's going to be with us, right? If we think about food production uh, around the world, we do collectively produce enough food. How do we get the food uh, to people uh, at a time uh, when we have the expansion of, of deserts physically uh, and, and we have other kinds of challenges, both natural and man-made, uh, in terms of doing that? Universal primary education, and this, where, this is where it becomes um, interactive and Gavin, see, we, we did have a chance to plan this. What are your thoughts about universal education? Just what do you think about it? Should everyone have a right to universal education? Okay. And so by having that right, what does it make possible in your perspective? And, and the livelihoods of others, right? Uh, because we saw Kevin... Uh, and Kevin had this idea that, yes, we can go to the optometrist, but, you know, I have this idea, you know, that people can do some things uh, to not only improve their sight, but it also provides for them uh, work and opportunities. Environmental sustainability. Uh, develop a global partnership or partnerships for development. Now, that's nothing new since the end of World War II. We have had uh, a litany of organizations uh, that engage in global partnerships and regional partnerships. Uh, we can think of, when I say Greenpeace, what comes to mind? And what's that name again? Um, Serato. Serato, what comes to mind for you? Greenpeace. Greenpeace. Is that one you've heard of? Let me, let me give you another one. <laughs> World Wildlife Fund. Heard of them? WWF? No. Okay. Thank you. She had two chances. And you are? Uh, Jude. Jude, yes. You've heard of either of those? Uh, no, actually. <laughs> okay. Has there, is there anyone in the room uh, besides myself and Mook and, and Nick and, and a few others? These are organizations that seek to benefit 
uh, society uh, from important perspectives. If I say World Wildlife Fund, then the clue to that is wildlife. <laughs> Thank you. Got it, okay? So uh, we won't stay with that. But this morning, I was watching BBC. Uh, I was watching uh, China Television. And I was watching CNN International. I like to sort of watch those in the morning uh, because it gives me an opportunity to get some insights in terms of how the world has changed from the previous day. And one of the things that was front and center and has been for a while, we've had a long ramp or run up in the economy since the year 2007, late in 2007. What happened? Uh, Tiki? Toski. Say it again, please. Thank you. What happened in late 2007 that impacted all of us? Yes. Yes, what happened? The economy, the global economy did what? It went down, right? And, and so what that meant then is the relative welfare. When we think of the sustainable development goals, but these millennial uh, development goals, that shifted almost one billion people from above the poverty line to below the poverty line, right? And, and so locally, we feel it in our communities, wherever those communities are, whatever the continent is. But that's what happens. Now we've had, this is 2019, and in early 2008, we started a long journey that has brought us to 2019, where there's been more prosperity. And so when there's more prosperity, it's, it's not always even, but it pulls us all up wherever we may live in the world. And so we've had that, but the clouds have been gathering that it's time, again, it looks like, for another dip. So the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals are about a, not only a call to action, but enabling actions at the local level here in Thailand, uh, Baltimore, wherever we may be in the world, it's organizing principles and it enables uh, change when we focus towards that change. So uh, let me give you a couple of more uh, statistical points. We still measure bottom of the pyramid. Yes. There we go. Thank you. Yes, I clicked here, but it's there. Thank you. Uh, so of the 7.4 billion people, uh, 4 billion, 4.2 billion still live on between 2 and $5 a day, right? So. Uh, if we think about uh, issues of, of certainly food security, uh, if we think of, of health of young people, uh, that's critical because what is, what is the nutrition intake? And we won't focus uh, so much on that right now, uh, but this notion of the bottom of pyramid uh, and the sustainable development goals really comes out of the work of Amartya Sen. Uh, how many of you have heard the name Amartya Sen? Okay, you need to not Google it now, but Google it later, please. You know, make notes. I'd like you to find out a little bit about uh, Amartya Sen. A very important economist. Uh, he's at Columbia University. Joseph Stiglitz, his colleague at Columbia. Bill Drayton, with whom I've worked with, uh, Jackie Novogratz, and others, these are people just like you and I who have the ideas that when it comes to humankind, 
they want to engage others about things that can not only change our collective fortunes and make investments in people and groups and organizations you know, that want to improve uh, and need capacity to improve outcomes for fellow human beings, whether those human beings are local or whether they're global. That's why I wanted to show a little bit of the video about Kevin because, uh, yes, he was a logistics officer in the U.S. Marine Corps, but his, he wants to partner and he seeks to partner with colleagues around the world on this important thing of vision so that wherever you are in the world, this model, this approach uh, is useful and beneficial. So in our I4H approach, Innovation for Humanity uh, and the Sustainable Development Goals, we call it uh, SDG, Social Entrepreneurship, and we also look at the notion of SDG-oriented social entrepreneurs. We make no distinction between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. You know, earlier in the development of uh, the Millennium Development Goals, and I can remember being in meetings in London, uh, Washington, uh, uh, Kenya, other parts of the world, uh, with colleagues just like you and, and myself. We're trying to figure this out. And we had some, some real challenges in terms of, well, entrepreneurs are only interested in making a profit. Well, yes. Well, what's the purpose of social entrepreneurship, right? That's to make profits that can be invested locally and can provide pathways forward. So let's not get caught in that type of discussion, right? We need ideas. We need ways in which we can advance and move forward. Good, I did it that time. I didn't make the screen go dark, right? Thank you. So I've already talked about uh, September, or at least alluded to, September 2015 uh, UN Summit where the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, were adopted and have been adopted. Uh, and I've given uh, the notion that, you know, the relative status of all of the country members, and this is a quick quiz, name again? T. That's an easy one for me. How many countries are members of the United Nations? Take a guess. He's really, he's on it. Uh, it, it depending on what you read, give him a hand. <laughs> depending on what you read, it's 196 or 200, right? And, and, and so, you know, there's not, there's no other global body that we have where we can have a community conversation. Yes, we have regional groups and organizations but the fact that everyone says whether we're a poor country by whatever metrics and measures, whether we're middle income, we're rich, those things are going to vary over time. Not all countries have the same natural resources or the range of resources, but one resource that all countries have, it's people, it's us. Right? And the degree to which we can develop that capacity, human capacity, then the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, make much more sense. And, and they are practical. I'm going to move to the next. I've talked a little bit about that. I just want to show you uh, a couple of pictures here. So these are some of our partners. Uh, I guess looking this way, it's left, and this way, it's right. You know, we've, uh, the group on the left is Aravind Eye Care. So for the past eight or nine years, we've sent a number of teams uh, to Hyderabad and Bangalore uh, because Aravind, again, is uh, an innovative organization. They've done significant research uh, into providing clinic-based, locally-based resources, again, around this issue 
of sight and improving hum human sight. And they've done it not only in India, but they've done it uh, in other quarters and areas of the world in terms of sharing their knowledge. And so one of the things in terms of our Innovation for Humanity teams, uh, which we take and, and, and we take it seriously, is that the comment is, yes, we're not the only business school or approach in terms of sustainable development goals, but our model, our approach, where we partner, where we co-create, you know, where we think and put those thoughts uh, in action together and just sort of give away the knowledge. When I say that to people, they say, you really want to just give us your tools? Why not? Why squander and hold on to tools, right? Because the more tools that people have, whatever the issue and the need, the better it is for the larger population. So that's, again, a mindset. Uh, the group on the right, uh, these are artisans. Uh, and in terms of Innovation for Humanity, uh, Baltimore to Bangkok, we've worked with a number of artisan groups uh, in different parts of the world, uh, including Baltimore, uh, which is a part of the world, uh, to bring cohesion, a sense of business practice, because this is the entrepreneurship, right? That is so important in terms of the social compact. So, because we are also an academic enterprise, just want to spend a minute or two on that enterprise, and then I want to get into uh, a couple of the papers, and uh, I hope uh, that you'll be able to, to read the papers, uh, but I want to highlight some things uh, from the publication. Uh, the intent is this. It's to link applied social business and entrepreneurship uh, options and possibilities to meet the challenges, to begin to take on the challenges of building sustainable, impactful businesses and incentivized community economic and social development nodes or parts of systems. Yes, at dinner last night, that's what I talked about, that with my faculty colleagues, both at Johns Hopkins and beyond, we see it as a system, right? And, and so it's not just one part, right? Because that's what systems dynamics theory is about. It's about what are those elements and nodes that come together to make sustainable change. Now, just want to tell you a couple of quick personal stories, and I'm mindful of the time. I think I'm managing it well. Uh, so it's good that that clock is there, and I know that I'll be pulled at a certain time. I uh, have worked with a number of foundations uh, in several capacities. Uh, we had a, a local project uh, in the Northern Virginia, uh, Washington, D.C., Southern Maryland area, uh, which is a microcosm of the world. Uh, when we were asked to come to the table uh, to be uh, a contributor. You know, we had 124 languages spoken in that microcosm, right? And uh, residents, citizens uh, from that number of countries. And we didn't have in-depth relationships. We didn't know who the people were, right? And so we created funds so that we could invest in leadership, development. We created funds uh, so that we could invest in capacity development. We created funds so that we could bring people together so that they could begin to talk about their neighborhood, their blocks, right, their communities, and how can we then get the capacity level of this community 
to a point of sustainability. The other thing that I want to say about sustainability, it's a trick word in many ways. Because um, working with the foundations, they say, well, we're going to give you three years funding, two years funding, five years funding, but then we want you to sustain, right? And, and so that's been part of our focus in terms of the research that we do. How do you do the work, build the capacity, provide the services, whatever the service or services are, and simultaneously address the issue of sustainability, which is financial, but it's more than that. And, and, and so that is where we're beginning to see uh, some models develop. And I'll talk a little bit about the circular economy momentarily, but I wanted to lay that, that out. So uh, we know that uh, Innovation for Humanity as we do it in our model at the Cary Business School is not a standalone. It's again, it's a, it's a part of a dynamic structure. One is solving organizational problems. Another way of saying that is it's consulting, but it's consulting in this space of the 17 sustainable development goals. Because having those skills and being able to fuse them with potential solutions that are business-based adds to the potential when engaging uh, your project sponsor or sponsors, which can be a government agency at the local level, the regional level, the national level, uh, can be a corporate partner. We have a number of corporate partners, right, who, ha who are engaged in corporate social responsibility. And that, and let me say a couple of things about corporate social responsibility. So, we're talking about uh, Innovation for Humanity at Cary Business School, the footprint, the partnership, but Pixera Global. Let me just say a, a little bit about Pixera Global. And we have a board meeting, uh, so I'll be back in the States in time to participate because I'm on the finance committee, right, important committee because we have to be stewards of the resources so that we can make the strategic investments in terms of the partnerships, the global partnerships that we have. And we're working in about 98 countries with a number of corporate partners. So not to mention so much their names, but, but listen carefully to what I want to say, what I will say. When we talk about conventional uh, corporate social responsibility, we may mean this. These are projects that are not significantly affecting a company's long-term operations, nor improving competitiveness. I know in the UK and France, uh, certainly in the US, a requirement of business is to make social investments where they do business. And in the US, that's roughly 4% of, of uh, after-tax profits, right, to show that they are doing some things in terms of sustaining. Now, I've met and worked with a number of corporate leaders in many companies, and these corporate leaders value people not only in the organization, but also value the communities where they do business, where their profits are made. And that is fine, right? But what we're talking about is strategic CSR, projects that are significantly affected by a company's activities in the ordinary course of business that can generate return on investment. And then there's a third aspect of corporate social responsibility, and that's the shared value model. That is not only a horizon, but it is an area, I think, for future investment. How can we build these things? And let me just say what that is. These are projects that enhance the competitiveness of a company while simultaneously advancing 
economic and social conditions in the communities in which it operates. So that's a deepening of the relationship. I personally see that in however it shows up in the world as being vital for future progress. And let me, while I've mentioned uh, this circular economy, what is the circular economy? Let me ask this final row. What do you think the circular economy is? You have, she has such a wonderful smile. You're welcome. Take a guess. I'm going to tell you what it is, but I'd like to hear. What is the circular economy? Take a guess, anyone, anyone. Well, you ready? Want me to tell you what it is? Would you like to know? Yes, that's, that's part of it. So let me give you, because I was saying, how am I going to say this this evening? So I wrote it out in shorthand. What is the circular economy model? It's an economic system aimed at minimizing waste and making the most of resources. Okay, then I want to give an example, real-time example, why at our board meeting on Friday, this is so very important, Friday of this week. It is a regenerative approach. So this is where business coming together with partners uh, at commu in communities, etc., can move towards regeneration. That benefits all. Regeneration benefits all. In contrast to the traditional linear economy. You know, if, if I held something up like a pin, you know, it, it would just sort of drop. That's not regenerative. I got to pick it up, which I will do momentarily. It goes round and round. Why is that important? Pixera Global was one of the several organizations in June invited uh, to an important meeting with uh, corporate leaders of some of the major corporations uh, around the world uh, around the issue of plastics. What do we know about plastics? And that name again? Yes, what do you know about plastics? Or not enough of it can be reused, right? And the statistics uh, that I've seen, you know, 92% of plastics, besides filling up the ocean and floating out there in the Pacific and the Atlantic and washing up and showing up everywhere, well, as some of our technologies for regeneration become stronger with AI, and when I say AI, I'm talking about, say that? Yes, right, and blockchain, right? So, so, so we have these new technologies that can adapt because that's important. One of the organizations, global organizations that I've worked with for a number of years is, is um, PepsiCo. And also have done a little bit of work with their number one global competitor who is Coca-Cola, right? They use enormous, both of those companies use enormous amounts of water, right? And they've improved their systems and approaches to the regenerative aspects of their business when it comes to water. Uh, and they're looking at how they can do something because they're sort of, they were sort of first in the game but how they can begin to adapt uh, the challenge of plastics. So I'm not going to say too much more because I've got like three minutes and I'm figuring out how I'm going to end this. Because uh, we'll have time for Q&A after, MOOC. Wonderful. So that's a little bit in terms of uh, the circular economy. And when we've had a nice meeting yesterday, we talked about innovation for humanity. I think I've laid out a lot of the model 
Uh, it's in three phases. It's, it's accelerated learning. It's both experiential uh, learning, right? Um, and in its second phase, it's actually it's adapt, uh, adaptation and implementation. And it's the actual uh, transfer space, right? So that uh, you, in terms of social business and social entrepreneurship, uh, whatever the group in the organization, it leads to something of, of shared value, of, of co-created value, that where the entity, be it a school, be it a healthcare system, hospital, uh, be it uh, housing, when we had our students saying, oh, well, when I came into this, I didn't realize, we didn't realize. They showed that very important grid, which was really important uh, for the organization to be able to sustain itself. So it's transitioning to becoming global immersion. We're learning to deliver in our model and approach at a faster uh, sustainable pace. Uh, here is Peru again. Uh, in addition to Baltimore, we are working also uh, in uh, several Native American uh, countries, which they are, uh, inside the U.S. Uh, these Native American uh, uh, countries have resources, but they don't necessarily have tools, uh, processes, uh, people, uh, enough skills uh, that they can grow their economies and begin to sustain the economies. So in my closing comments, uh, we've made available uh, to you two recent papers, one from this year uh, and one from two years ago, uh, titled Community Development and a Sustainably uh, Just Future. Uh, in that, we anchor it in community development theory, uh, the initial theory of community development and how economies and scales uh, or economies of scale in terms of change, you know, are anchored. Uh, the primary definition uh, is the UN definition from 1948. Uh, you'll see that uh, in the paper, but there's one piece I want to read. Uh, to you, uh, and it's from the Community Development Society. If this is work that any of you, all of you, each of you, from your vantage point and what you're doing uh, matters to you, it's fulfilling, right? You're a part of the change that you want to see uh, in your local community, in your business organization, from an ecosystem perspective, then community development as a profession integrates knowledge from many disciplines. It's taking theory. Say, for me, a trained philosopher, just having the idea is not enough. I got to get in there and roll up my sleeves with people and contribute. I'm not there to be in charge of it. I want to be a part of the living change. I live in a community too, right? And if, if that's my interest, then whatever it is that I can co-labor and co-create, that's what I want to be able to contribute to. So my belief is like this. Society, however we define that, it's localized, it's regional, it's global, there's a lot of variations of it, uh, must be proactive by providing leadership uh, to professionals and citizens across the spectrum of community development. In so doing, we believe uh, the society must be open and responsive to the needs of its members through provisions and services which enhance professional development. One final comment, because I know I've gone over by a minute or two. Um, in doing this work, this is 10 years of, of work, uh, it's ongoing work. Uh, 
we know that it's hard work. And the last piece that I want to say, and, and we have uh, provided these two papers. Uh, this first paper uh, came out of uh, international meeting through the Unitech Institute of Technology uh, in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. This other paper is about culture conflict and team management. Uh, and again, again, it's about experiential learning and business practice to support community uh, development entrepreneurship. My final statement, because I see MOOC is moving towards me, uh, is simply this. We have lots of tools, right? The Sustainable Development Toolkit uh, is there. It's available, you know, not only from the Johns Hopkins Cary Business School perspective, but you can go on and there are all kinds of tools. The importance of facilitation matters. Uh, but there are going to be these conflicts, and that's where communication uh, and being able to have deliberative communication is essential for moving things forward. Uh, in my capacity, uh, in a number of areas, that's where I've seen uh, in multiple experiences either advancements in this work, right, that, that is locally owned, locally advanced, businesses are at the table. It's being able to communicate within the cultural context and getting beyond some of the uh, culturally communication roadblocks that can occur, right? One of them is power, right? And, and so how do we navigate and, and manage that power? Uh, and so I'll pause there uh, on page three uh, we, we align uh, some of the interest of a range of organizations, some that, that we've talked about, and their SDG goals. Uh, I'll say this uh, from one of my mentors, Dr. Edgar Schein, and he said, in, in terms of what is culture, uh, Schein says, culture like role lies at the intersection of several social sciences and reflects some of the biases of each specifically, those of anthropology, sociology, social psychology, and organizational behavior. So it is a multidimensional reality, this notion of culture. And lastly, for now, so we can have some questions and more interchange, one of the early dynamics as we got started 10 years ago with Innovation for Humanity, we would say to our teams, you're not going in to wherever, Kenya, Peru, etc., as saviors or any of that kind of mentality. You've got to meet people where they are. You've got to begin to understand people, right? develop a way to listen. We all bring biases, right? That's, being biased is normal and natural. I like my drinks cold. Some people like them warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and those things jump out when we're doing this kind of work, right? And, and things are said, and the other party or parties don't react and don't respond. But, You've delivered a message. We've delivered a message. And, and so in this paper, uh, we offer some insights. Uh, we've made it available uh, for you, and I'll pause there. I'm going to stop now and take questions. I want to ask right away, uh, right off, jumping off of the thing about culture. Um, <clears throat> and just visualizing, you know, these folks coming in from, from let's say, the U.S. Uh, with different both language, language and culture in a very short amount of time, coming into a very sensitive situation, you know, the personal things. Yes. So how, how do you guys overcome that? And uh, do, you, do you need also help with, like, translation and things like that? How does yes. that all work out? 
Yes, thank you. And, and let me say a little bit about our process. So we will have in a global MBA class, uh, on average, 20 to 24 different cultures represented. Uh, countries and, and country cultures. So uh, depending on, you know, 20, 25% of our students are from uh, the Indi Indian continent. And sometimes it's, it's the north part of India. Sometimes it's the southern part. And just watching that dynamic, they're both from India, but they don't speak the same language, right? And the cultural traditions are different, right? So uh, we won't, uh, if, if you're from India, you can't go back to India, right? You've got to go to one of our other country locations. We do something uh, early on uh, to begin to get uh, our new GMBAs into uh, cultural conversations. And we utilize a number of resources and I'd be glad to share to drive that. So faculty have a role in that. And uh, we have to practice. It's not that sometimes um, if someone is from Azerbaijan to, to, to mention that country that uh, they're just going to do this stuff, but people are going to do what they do naturally. And uh, that's all of us. So we facilitate the dialogue. Uh, we facilitate uh, learning. Uh, we have tools and methods so that they can engage with the sponsor. We do have translation, right? And in a number of what we do when we put teams together, we want to know the languages that they have. So uh, if it's in let's say Rwanda, then uh, mostly English is going to be spoken, right? When I had Aravind air care, uh, air, that's not necessarily the case. When you go out from Hyderabad, you know, uh, 75 or 100 kilometers, and you're actually on site in a village, right? Uh, same thing. Uh, in Peru when we were up in the hills there. And with the Native American populations, it's similar because those cultures all maintain their language and, and traditions. And, and so I would not be telling you the truth if it's not hard. It's hard to learn and to begin to accept traditions other than your own but it is possible. And one of the things that we expect is, yes, you bring your finance skills, your marketing skills, your supply chain management skills, you know, whatever those skills are, general management, right, data analytics, all of those things. And when we put a team together, it's already a blended team from different academic disciplines because Again, it's a systemic approach. If we have all accounting and marketing, we're going to get some, uh, well, accounting and finance, we're going to get some great numbers. We don't know if those numbers work. We don't know if they're applicable. I can almost assure you that the client, the project sponsor, is not going to know anything more. They're going to be frustrated, right, because they're focused on why this number is important. And the sponsor says, look, you know, I got to get this bread or this millet to the next town. What are you telling me about these numbers? So we don't fall into that trap. So it's a number of things that start in Baltimore at the introduction, right? Because part of it is we expect the teams to manage the communication and the conversation with their sponsor. And we have resource groups. To, to work with that. So we will have translation in country. We have university partners where we're working. And they provide wonderful resources because then we can further in culture the teams. And then the final thing in terms of, of that with uh, the teams, we want 
them to say experientially what you learned. And the most two things that are, are vital. One, that you've learned to begin working as a team. It's a, it's a lifelong uh, project, right? Because if I'm used to doing things on my own, I'll just give a, a quick example. About eight years ago, I was with one of our teams. And uh, so there are two laptops this way and two laptops, and I'm sitting over here at the side, and I hear everybody talking, and I ask the question, do you talk? What do you think the response was? That's exactly what it was. I'm sorry for putting it, but that's what it was. And I said, but you're sitting there, and I recognize that that's the preference. So I said, you can't do that with your sponsor, all right? In this case, you couldn't do it with the sponsor because a couple of them said to me, he talks all the time. So I said, well, then that should be a clue to you that you need to adapt your approach so that you can meet your sponsor. So we don't get in the way, but we know that we have to bridge sometimes. And, and so that's important. I hope I've answered some of the question. Hi. Yes, so longitudinal, yes. So is there more before I respond? How, um, here's how we measure. Um, one of the things that we require is that whatever the potential solution or helping achieve the solution like the team that we saw, so they developed this matrix, right? But they didn't develop the matrix from their own insights. They worked from the very beginning with the project sponsor because uh, the project sponsor in this case, uh, they built housing as, as they said. Uh, and so the investors were several banks, right? And the challenge initially with the banks is we make these investments. How do we know that we're getting a return on our investment? And so we started with a tool uh, which any of us uh, can get. We started with the Kaplan and Norton balance scorecard. Okay, which is a nice framework. The nice things about frameworks is they can be adapted. And so in the first phase, working with the sponsor, we said, what are some of the inputs so that the sponsor is going to know uh, that they're able to deliver, they're able to say what the investment uh, that is needed uh, and how that can be applied. So in phase one, they develop the first aspect of the tool. When the team went in country and began to meet with the sponsor as well as a couple of the banks and other financial partners, they all had input, right, so that uh, those who are providing the finance could begin to see, ah, okay, so when we give, and, I'll, and um, Nuevo Solis uh, is, is the finance uh, in Peru, we make, you know, 500,000 Nuevo Solis, we see where that's going to go. So that enabled that initial piece. By developing it further, in the three weeks that they were in country, then they were able to have a common tool so that the investors said, we can invest. We do a final report. Each team has to do a final report and follow up. And we follow up uh, after year one to see if whatever uh, the innovation the invention, how it is being used uh, 
by the sponsor. Another one that I'd like to say was uh, a cancer foundation. Uh, and let me just talk a little bit about that. Over a three-year period, we had three successive teams. So the thing I don't want to convey is that one time in does it. Sometimes it's multiple years. And with this Cancer Foundation, uh, in this particular country, uh, they bring young kids, and I played knock hockey with them in chess. I almost got beat a couple times, but it wouldn't have mattered, right? My ego wouldn't have been shattered, right? Because you're in the human condition. And, and so the measurement there was they were at full capacity. And so they had investors who wanted to extend the capacity of the cancer house by 60%. And even that wouldn't have been enough given the rising incidence of cancers. So successive teams over three years sort of chunked it out in ways in which it made uh, sense to both our sponsor partner organization and the investors who ultimately did add another floor, right? And while it's not uh, 200,000 people, but 60% more beds means then that the quality of the health care provided, right, uh, for the young cancer victims uh, and a parent who's with them means that they could serve more people. And, and so we get that. Um, in healthcare, in a hospital, one that I uh, want to talk about, we worked with this particular hospital for eight years, right? Let me give you uh, some numbers. In the district, it's a municipal hospital. It serves um, over 500,000 residents annually. It's the only municipal hospital in the district, and it's a 110-bed hospital, right? So they had specialties. Here's what the challenge was. You could go there on a given day, and it would be a sea of humanity. Lines here, lines there. Eight years of work, because it was a systemic approach, what we said is we see this hospital, which when we came to it uh, was a level three hospital, which determined the amount of municipal funding that it received, right? By year five, our inputs and inputs of other groups because we can't claim it all, they had moved to a level two. So we were able to see not only are they, uh, it's not so much serving more, it's serving better. That was one of the indicators. And, and so the data by these recommended improvements and the adoption, because uh, for this healthcare facility, uh, they would receive their allotment. And this is during, and, and, and when this occurred over these eight years, uh, there were three different presidents. So imagine what happens when you're doing this work, right? And there's a change at the top, which means then everybody else changes. So you've, I don't want to convey that uh, things are static, because they're not. You know, new people come in, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, and they want to assert themselves. They have that right. But it can interrupt change. It can interrupt things that are in process. Hmm? And so the proposal now, uh, because now there's a fourth president in the country. I won't mention the country, <laughs> right? But with the, the, the local health ministry, the investment that this particular hospital could make, they could only make the investments when they can demonstrate that they've reprogrammed uh, 
when their systems improve, they could capture those monies and then invest them towards, right? So that's the systems approach that we were talking a little bit about last night. Now, we can go to their website. You know, they mention our efforts and efforts of other partners. And that's all that we wanted to do. You know, if we can enhance and improve their capabilities so that they're more effective and we can measure that and give them tools but because I can remember the first time we walked into their records room. It was piled floor to ceiling with handwritten medical records. Hmm? And so those are some of the challenges that you face. Over eight, well, nine years, we introduced, we were able to get them to reset and to actually begin some automation. While doing that automation, they also uh, had come to find out they had three legacy systems that didn't talk to each other, right? So that in itself remains a challenge, right? How do you get these legacy systems to do that? There are other kinds of measures. Uh, one in, uh, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, we were working with the Catholic Relief Services. So they're one of our uh, strategic partners. Uh, and for CRS, uh, young mothers uh, were, because of their economic status, rather than take the nutrition being provided, right, so that they could grow and deliver healthy, healthier babies, they were selling it, right? And so that became a behavioral piece, right? Working uh, with the government uh, in Addis Ababa, so we have followed that to see if some of the things that we recommended in terms of helping shift the behavior are showing signs of improvement. But that's, again, where you're encountering deep cultural things. Hmm? But the, the, the data and being able to simplify the data so that it's useful in the context of where the application is taking place, then those agencies, social development uh, agencies, are able to track. So those, those are some of the instances. In education, similarly so, right? Um, Peru, while it made great strides during the Millennium Development Goals, actually moved from being in the poor group to the middle class group, part of that is where it is in the trade cycle in the world. When you look at future indicators, and that's one of the things uh, that uh, I saw this morning on BBC, demographics matter heavily in this work. Uh, my understanding of demographics was strengthened when I was working in Washington, D.C at an organization called the Center for Demographic Policy, uh, simply knowing that every 10 years you can see change and the amount of change that, that you've in, envisioned, right? So uh, this piece that I'm talking about now simply is uh, Peru has a real challenge in sustaining uh, its trajectory because it hasn't made the investments in basic education. And until it makes those investments in basic education, which we, we recommend in others, so the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, World Bank, you know, others, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have all said the same thing. You've got to invest in the development of your young people to be able to sustain this wave. Yeah, you have people here now, but who's following them? And so we think it's the collective efforts and insights that they are now doing it. 
but there will be some ripples. India, right, which just put a rocket up uh, or something that's going to the moon, faces the same challenge. Right? Yeah, they've got great scientists, great engineers, right? But demographically, have they made the investments and have they made the investments over time to be able to sustain? That's part of sustainability is making investments, right? And that's where the ecosystem requires business, you know, government, leadership, citizens. That's my perspective. So I hope I've answered some of the questions. Okay, I just have been, I hope uh, that this conversation uh, has been real. Well, thank you. just want to say a big thank you to Professor Carmen for, for the talk and really your work is inspiring. Um, thank you. We at Satsun look forward to partnering with you to, to take this further. Likewise. Great, thank you. Some gift for you. Oh, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity that uh, 